Wschód. Respect and praise. And an invitation for next. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I? My microphone is still. Is it on? Yes. Ah. Okay. Um, welcome to. I believe the last panel discussion at this year led strategic forum. This puts all of us under some pressure to keep your attention. Uh, we will try to be on point and talk on an issue that uh, there was a creative author behind this title, EU enlargement in the Western Balkans, an old feeling of a new beginning. It sounds somewhat philosophical. My interpretation is that uh, we have enlargement back in the European spotlight to a large extent because of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the subsequent application of Ukraine, followed by Moldova and Georgia for candidacy of the EU. And I think this confrontational geopolitical context and these new, two new candidate countries inevitably uh, make decision makers to focus on the region and to see whether we can create some movement and progress. So in that sense, this perhaps could be a new beginning. Whether it's going to be the old feeling, uh, we will see. Uh, we've had several efforts to make a jump start of this policy that has been arguably one of the most successful policies of the Union to expand its narrative of value, values in its neighborhood. Enlargement essentially is about transforming societies in line with the Copenhagen criteria, democratic and economic reforms to finally have proper, functional, uh, vibrant European democracies with developed economies governed by the rule of law. Our region has been promised membership as back as Zagreb 2000 and Thessaloniki 2003. The last country that joined is neighboring Croatia uh, that negotiated for 68 months. And since then, we don't have much to show in terms of progress. We have Montenegro negotiating for 121 months, closing three chapters. And we have Serbia negotiating for 102 months, closing two chapters. Several countries uh, just started accession talks, like Albania. And North Macedonia half started the accession talks, because unlike all the others, we, have, we need two IGCs to actually open the process. The first took place in July. The second is contingent upon constitutional amendments and a number of bilateral steps that we need to do under this bilateral protocol with uh, Bulgaria. So um, the big question and our goal today is to talk openly hopefully come up with some ideas how to do this better. The process works if it's merit-based, so that you reward those that perform, name and shame or sanction those that go backwards, backsliding, and the ultimate reward, which must be realistic and tangible, is the promise of membership. This is the basic idea of the enlargement towards the region. Now, uh, merit is not quite there because of various reasons, in part because 
some member states use the process to pursue their national, sometimes nationalistic goals. So you have individual vetoes uh, on various issues, not always related to the Copenhagen criteria. And then, because of political considerations, it is not easy for member states or EU institutions to actually say, this is backsliding. And you have to correct this because of relationship or other issues, bigger issues, etc. So, the European Commission's own assessment, and a few years ago they made them, you can track progress and you can even quantify and then compare how countries are doing, uh, puts uh, both North Macedonia and Albania in terms of how ready they are to join on par with Montenegro and Serbia. In some areas, like the Fundamentals Cluster, uh, sometimes even doing better than these countries that are in the process for years. This, what does this tell us about the process, if it's about transformation? And uh, whether uh, the perspective of membership if we put this perspective of membership in the perspective of the region where countries have been in the waiting room, I know one very well, for 17 years as a candidate country, uh, is this membership realistic? Can you see it? And is it present in the calculus of the minds of the leaders? So, um, and uh, as and I'm bringing this to a close so that not to monopolize the, uh, the panel, because I have extremely distinguished and uh, experienced and relevant panelists today for you. Uh, some years ago, uh, French President Macron talked about the need to settle the house, the big, beautiful European house, first before we invite new tenants. Uh, yesterday, or the day before, I'm mixing days, Chancellor Scholz said that enlargement is about stability and security, that it's a must, but that it will require a reform of the EU decision-making in terms of the consensus, move towards qualified majority voting, and he talked also about number of commissioners and uh, some reforms in the European Parliament. So I think we have to open these questions realistically, talk about them openly. If, and I actually believe it is legitimate, to be concerned whether the EU is efficient, even on the continent, let alone at the global stage, if it struggles to make decisions, be it on sanctions, on foreign policy issues, on values such as human rights or rule of law, etc. So it is a legitimate question in the mind of leaders whether the EU will be even less functional if we have more uh, members. So our goal, at least my goal, is to open up these issues and see whether we can come up with some solutions how to make this a more realistic and honest process that will really motivate reformers and result in progress of the democracies and the economies uh, in the region. So, um, with this, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, my friend and I think known to all of you probably, Alexander Adam from the Elysee, uh, Europe advisor in the private office of the president of the French uh, Republic. And maybe if I can dare to invite you to speak on these issues. Is really membership on the table for the six countries in uh, the Western Balkans? And maybe some ideas how to make this process maybe introduce more timely incentives in addition to this final one, the membership, and some ideas how to make it a transformational process, because I think we are in this together. 
We are all Europeans. It's good for the EU and it's good for the citizens of the Western Balkans for this process to be successful. For us to be more like the country that we aspire to. The vibrant, successful democracies and economies governed by the rule of law of, on, on the continent. So, please, Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, and thanks again to the Led Strategic Forum for uh, this invitation. And usually, when you invite a French representative to a debate on enlargement, you expect him to be the bad cop, but I won't be that one today, so you would be disappointed. On the contrary, um, uh, I, I must say that, that if I would have been told some years ago that the French presidency would be the one when we would grant candidate status to Ukraine, Moldova, European perspective to Georgia, and after the work uh, that we have been done between Bulgaria and North Macedonia and uh, the Czech presidency finish the job, that we could convene uh, IGCs uh, for North Macedonia and Albania, I would not have believed it, but I find it a success uh, and I think uh, a signal that we are still moving. But for sure, this is not enough. For sure, this is not enough, and we can just not I mean, celebrate this as a, uh, and, and, and shift to some other issue. As you said, uh, enlargement to the Western Balkan now is again on the top uh, of the leaders' agenda. The European Council, or I should say the, the summit before the European Council of June was of course perhaps a bit of a disappointment to some extent, but nevertheless, this will be on the agenda of the leaders for the next European Council, and I'm sure uh, in October, December, and we will continue to do so. In that respect, um, the methodology uh, is a key issue, and to answer your question, is really membership on the table? I'm really convinced that it is, because the geopolitical context, uh, no need to say, has radically uh, changed. Uh, but we have to reconcile, uh, but you mentioned it, this very difficult um, issue, which is how to reconcile a process which is merit-based, based on conditions, and at the same time, uh, keeping the flame of the EU perspective alive, of course, for leaders, experts, etc., but also for the citizens of the region. And what we witnessed, and you, and you reminded us uh, how long the process has been for, uh, for those countries during the last years. Um, uh, I mean, the mere light of the Treaty of Accession at the end of the tunnel for sure today is not enough. That is very clear. Um, uh, and I would add two, I mean, two remarks. Um, when we proposed, but I must say with inspiration from think tanks from the Western Balkans, uh, late 2019, it was uh, the new methodology which was then uh, uh, proposed by the Commission. That was the idea of uh, incentives, also of reversibility, uh, and really accompanying the candidate uh, states uh, much more and this is something really I want to, 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 to stress today because others will speak I think much better than I do uh, about the, the different models of stage uh, accession um, but we need to be to have more technical assistance I'm sure in the Western Balkans we need to be to have more financial investment in our proposal back in 2019, we had proposed that uh, the, the candidate countries progressively uh, benefit from the structural funds. Uh, that they do not get, I mean, a big amount of money the day they're in, but progressively, according to uh, uh, their progress, uh, a share of uh, the structural funds, because one of the objectives of the accession process is also to have the, conver the socio-economic convergence with the member states. But we are quite witnessing the opposite right now. Um, the, the third point is we also have to do our homework, and really speaking about France as well here, when talking to our public opinions. Uh, and explaining what enlargement is about. And we have seen, and there are, I mean, uh, surveys uh, about this, 
that explaining that in the current geopolitical context with the war in Ukraine, having Ukraine, Moldova, and the Western Balkans in the EU is key for the stability of the European continent. It's, and, and when you use the geopolitical argument, this works with our fellow citizens. And so we have this kind of, of responsibility. And uh, sorry, my last remark would be, um, my president said something some years ago, so I'm supposed to say the exact same thing, but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh, time has passed. Um, I'm not sure that there is a contradiction in this uh, uh, binary question as old as the European construction between deepening of the EU and enlargement. I'm not sure that there's a contradiction uh, and that the two can be dealt with in parallel. And even more that our feeling, this is also what the German Chancellor said uh, yesterday, there's a need for reform of the institutions uh, but precisely, I mean, because we need more democratic process, more efficiency in the decision making, uh, but we will have to do it before uh, uh, the, the accession of new members, and therefore the reform becomes an opportunity. It's because we will have, and we will accept new members, that we will have, I think, the political impetus to do such reforms and which will take time, but which can really be done in parallel with the enlargement process. If I may, a very brief uh, sub-question on the relationship and how do you see it between the idea for the European political community and uh, enlargement, as, sure. as brief as possible. As brief as I, I was too, that, that means I was too long, sorry. Um, no. no, sure. I, I mean, uh, usually since May, uh, one, uh, each time a French representative takes the floor about the EPC, he repeats three or four times that this is not a substitute to enlargement. So uh, I will say it again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but one of the core ideas, and that's something I, I mentioned in, in, in the panel, panel previously, one of, uh, of the core ideas, um, well, first, it's not about just the EU and candidate countries being around the same table. I mean, this is a wider forum where we want to associate the UK, Norway, Iceland, etc., uh, to have strategic discussion on uh, common challenges. Um, but it was also about what the, 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 the nature of the relationship between the EU and candidate countries, because usually, my experience, uh, from um, uh, EU Western Balkan Summit is that it's a lot about enlargement and it's a lot about an hour on, on the EU side repeating the promise of the European perspective and on the Western Balkan side repeating the frustration. And in the end, we don't have in those kind which nevertheless are useful, but I think the proper setting uh, to have discussion on the same footing it's not a kind of asymmetrical relationship or like a tutor or it's really on the same footing that each of the members on the same footing can have their say uh, in uh, what they think are the challenges for, for the continent. And so the relationship to enlargement, not a substitute, but what we have really to work on, and that's why this, this, is, this discussion also is important, um, is whether the EPC can also politically help in driving uh, the different steps of a gradual accession, I mean, give, giving the political impetus in that framework. But this is really an open question. Thank you so much. We will move to civil society Belgrade, or the, or the think tank head of, of Belgrade, to Milena Lazarevic, program director and co-founder of the European Policy Center who, uh, for those who follow the enlargement debate, is very much in the spotlight with the idea of staged accession. And I will briefly ask two questions. One is this dichotomy, uh, deepening reforms on the EU side first, and then enlargement. I think there are some ideas there that make sense in terms of not only reconciling the concepts, but even reinforcing both the reforms and 
the expansion. And second, because of the length of the process, we talked about the months. Um, and the fact that now we have a process that front loads obligations and that keeps the incentives towards the end, uh, does it make sense to depart from this binary approach into a more gradual where there will be more timely incentives for those who do their homework? Thank you, Nicola. And um, I will start from the second question, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, because uh, this is precisely the origin of the very idea of staged accession, it, and it was actually in the origin of our earlier work back in 2018, from which also some of the French proposals uh, back uh, in the day uh, borrowed. Um, and the idea was exactly to depart from this dichotomy all out, all in approach and to try to um, uh, make the process more gradual and ensure that we front load some of the benefits uh, that normally would belong to membership stages to front load them as early as possible in order to incentivize uh, political commitment to reforms which sometimes are quite difficult and as you mentioned in your introduction often because of the length of the process uh, for the time horizon of a politician in the region uh, and because of the short electoral cycles in the region, the EU integration process somehow um, loses its relevance. Uh, so we want, we, uh, the idea was precisely to make the EU integration relevant again politically and to incentivize those reforms, but at the same time to uh, win back the hearts of the, of, of, of the people in the region by bringing the benefits, tangible benefits, closing this, helping closing uh, socio, uh, the socioeconomic gap uh, with the EU. And this is where uh, the ideas for the pre-accession stages that we organized the, the proposal in come from. The two pre-accession stages actually are built around bundles of benefits, which we believe could make this difference in unlocking the political will, which seems to be lacking, frozen, or lost somewhere in the region. Whereas in the second part of the, of, of the process, which we have uh, envisaged, we are actually proposing that also the region uh, shows some political maturity and gives something as a, as a concession, in a way, to the EU member states understanding that the EU is also in the process of internal reforms and saying, okay, uh, we, want, we don't want to wait in front of the door of the house until you, uh, you put it in order. We want to be part of that process, we want to participate in the process, but because we understand that you have two key problems with the internal functioning of the EU, one related to excessive use of unanimity uh, uh, voting, the other one related to the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of the Article 7 procedures to keep member states in check on rule of law and democracy, we propose to make some temporary derogations of membership rights and benefits and post-accession monitoring period, which would basically ensure that the EU can use this period of our membership, the first years of our membership, to put its house in order. Thank you so much for that and for being so brief and yet comprehensive. So, as a moderator in charge of time management, special gratitude. <laughs> now, um, now to the Deputy Managing Director at the European External Action Service and uh, another good friend, Marko Makovets. Maybe uh, as an opener for you because, I mean, you're in charge of many things but also common CFCP, common foreign and, and security policy. Uh, in times of war on the continent, and all important sanctions against the aggressor and helping the victim, this uh, consolidation of all of us in Europe, this is in the spotlight. And alignment is encouraged and of course expected from the six countries in the Western Balkans, where not all of us are doing great uh, on an issue that is uh, so drastically important. Now, there is a relationship between, uh, first, of all, first of all, how involved the countries are in, the, in your decision making. And I recall that uh, High Representative Borrell actually invited the foreign ministers of the countries in the region to discuss the situation in Ukraine in May, 
if I'm not mistaken. So can we hope to see more of this? Because if you expect alignment, it's wise to involve and discuss and engage with the countries in the region. And second, I think the more realistic uh, the accession process is, the more political pressure there will be for all to really fully uh, align. Thanks. You have the floor. Pozdravljeni. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing us to, for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> let me start by um, reminding us all about a very important commitment that has been taken some 20 kilometers away from here on the 6th of October last year, when heads of states of governments of EU27 plus the six Western Balkans decided to work on the security and defense issues as partners, not as demandeur provider, but as partners. Uh, of course, 24th of February happened. It was a game changer. <clears throat> Suddenly, we have a really blunted violation of international law. We have a war of attrition happening in Ukraine. And this is significantly has changed the whole uh, geopolitical uh, picture and structure. But we don't have only a military conflict. We also have a conflict or confrontation of two main con state concepts. Democracy against authoritarian um, regime. And this is something that is extremely important. This is also why we ask for our partners from the region to align with, first of all, the restrictions and sanctions that we have introduced in order to stop the, um, the military aggression in Ukraine, but also to prove that the strategic decision that the Western Balkans countries have taken um, is still there. And they have taken the decision to become a members of the EU. And this is something that we, it's still on the table. I would like to confirm it. It is still something that, that we absolutely are committed to. Now, that is also why we highly value all that align 100% with the uh, common security and foreign policy. But we also expect the others to follow. I believe that this alignment transcends the framework of the accession negotiations. It goes further because it speaks about the strategic choice of what kind of system and what kind of principles and values the, the countries would like, to, would like to embrace or follow. Now, it might, it might sound a little bit um, autocratic, but this is, the, this is exactly the transformation of the society and systems that the enlargement should, uh, should bring. And this is also, this is exactly the reason why the um, enlargement is still considered as one of the most successful policies of the EU. It's not so black and white. The fact is that all Western Balkans countries aligned with all uh, UN General Assembly resolutions, voted with the, with the EU and the partners uh, in the Council of Human Rights. The fact is that in order to really grant, candid, not, uh, to grant the full membership, some member states expect more, more commitment. Um, and as for what we, are what we are doing is we are engaging more with the Western Balkans countries in order to build resilience, in order to build um, capacities to react on new threats, especially cyber and, um, and hybrid and disinformation, uh, which are present. We have clear cases in, in your countries. It's something that is not anymore a theory, it's something that is happening real time, and this is also why the HRVP mobilized um, five millions for um, a rapidly reaction mechanism to build capacities for counter uh, the cyber attacks, to build uh, capacities to counter uh, false narratives and media manipulation. This is this war in Ukraine, it's not only about military, it's very much about uh, disinformation and military um, and, and media manipulation. We had recently in, the, um, in, in Kosovo this, um, um, this one of the many examples of, uh, of this uh, media campaign and it is something that we are now very much working on in order to provide much, much more to, to the Western Balkans countries. We do include all Western Balkans in all our policies as regard uh, say, uh, food safety and energy. So one of the most important um, EU policies to mitigate the negative impact of the war on the energy sector, which is the joint purchases of hydrogen, LNG uh, and, uh, and gas, is equally spread on and equally includes also the Western Balkans countries. We will not let you down on this. 
And there is another thing, um, the, the invitation to, um, to the Western Balkans ministers at the Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. Council is also showing that how we see the Western Balkans countries. Look, immediately after the war, we first invited Blinken. It was necessary because of the trans transatlantic things, lines, um, links, relations. After that, it was the, the uh, foreign minister for, of UK and Canada. Norway, Iceland, and then comes the Western Balkans. These are the 10 strategic partners of the European Union. These are the closest allies. I'll stop here with a moment. <laughs> it's a, it was a very good line to stop. Closest allies <laughs> and the best strategic friends. And it's a good company to be with Canada, UK, and Norway. Um, the European integration of the region is uh, an obvious vision for permanent stability in the region that is part of the continent. It brings all countries to work together. It makes border less important, not more important. Uh, and it makes them, the idea is to make them better democracies where justice prevails and politicians are not uh, untouchable. Um, so, my, my question to you, um, Special Envoy to the Western Balkans, Prime Minister's Office, United Kingdom, Sir Stuart Peach, uh, having also in mind your background uh, in security issues and military, etc., how do you see this relationship, how important it is? Um, once in London, this is a teaser, I was asked by a journalist at Sky News, why do you want to join the EU when we're leaving? And I said, for those of you who have not been on the outside, it's cold. Is it cold yet <laughs> in the UK or not really? Selfishly, I think the whole region really misses your role as a big friend of of, of, of the region, and I think uh, we feel it. Also, in terms of the debate on, on enlargement, so this is payback for the teaser. Uh, please, you have the floor. Nicola, thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. And the UK is part of Europe, and I'm grateful to Marco for uh, his words, and I agree with everything that's been said. The UK continues to support the Euro-Atlantic journey and I think those words are important, the Euro-Atlantic journey for everybody in the region, all countries. We have never wavered from that support and we continue to support it with every, at every level. I would also add, I mean, Marco called it a game changer. We must understand, I think, as this conference has made very clear, and thank you to Peter Gurk for making it so clear, that the war launched by Russia against Ukraine isn't just about the battlefield and the terrible tragedies affecting Ukraine and indeed Russian families. It is more than that. We've seen the weaponization of energy. It's not a theory. It's out there now and it's about to get colder. We've seen the weaponization of food security and the difficulty of getting grain, which a lot of which goes to places where there's already not enough food. We've seen that and it's been really tough and difficult. We see cyber attacks. Again, this is not theory, it's reality. And in my role as the military head of NATO for three years, the idea that this is some, something we can take our time over, can I say to everyone, cyber is real, it's here, it's now, and it's urgent. And of course, the idea that this is somehow a game and it doesn't damage and it doesn't do much harm, that's just not true. The theft of medical data, the data by which logistics is managed, the way in which we keep ourselves warm through energy and power stations and so on. This is really life and death stuff. So what I'm saying is, not because of my background or my nationality, as a part of the Euro-Atlantic journey and accession and all the difficulties that are outlined, we need to be mindful of the risks that are here and now, that the Europe we have it doesn't matter about the membership of the clubs from a UK perspective. We need to be working together as a team in Europe on all these risks. And the UK can help, will help, and we have money as well as expertise, as well as our defence role. And I will mention NATO. 
I think it's really important that we understand the complementary nature of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, our alliance, which keeps one billion people safe and secure, with the European Union. Journalists in Brussels like to talk about the friction between the European Union and NATO, because they're journalists. Actually, I chaired the military committee between NATO and the European Union regularly, frequently, and we came together on issues as well as by time. And that complementary nature between the two organizations has, I would argue, never been more important. So your membership of the Alliance, wherever you sit, isn't the first vaccination before you get the second one. <laughs> it is part of the security and stability for the whole continent. The UK is absolutely committed to our NATO membership and our friends in the United States and Canada, who are also part of the Euro-Atlantic journey. And if I finish on values, the more I travel in the region, and I'm grateful to all the countries that, that uh, invite me and I visit frequently, the more I'm convinced that we need, as you have done here, Peter, with the young leaders, we need to give more hope to the next generation, that we understand the security challenges thrown at us, and we can deal with them together. And if we don't give that hope, then the people who wish us harm will continue to push and win. Because that influence, and let me end on a sober note, that influence by Russia, and increasingly by China, is not in the interest of this conversation. So we need to push back against it and give hope to the next generation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, hope is extremely important, and I think that's why honesty about the deficiencies of the process and, how, and ideas how to fix it are really, fix it are really important. Uh, our friend Manuel Saracin, formerly a member of the Bundestag, is uh, today a German federal government special representative. I made this accent because uh, I mistake sometimes representatives and envoys. A special representative for the countries of, of the Western Balkans. Someone we all know for a long time because he also had an interest in the region as a member of the Bundestag for the uh, German Greens. Um, we welcome, uh, I think, at the obvious interest of the if we could call it still the new German government in the European integration of the region. We all expect to hear more about the restart of the Berlin process in, in uh, early November, I think. So, Manuel, if I ask you behind closed doors without audience, uh, are you hopeful? about our region? Where do you see us in a few years from now? Uh, what would you tell me? First, Nicola, I mean, you're desperately searching for a bad cop. And after the French already fall out with a real great statement, <laughs> and the UK is positive, you're now asking the Germans, right? <laughs> but, you know, regarding a lot of topics in European policy, you know, we're usually the bad cops, but in enlargement, we almost never have been. But I have to remember you, uh, when the Copenhagen promise was done, it was not in the way that Helmut Kohl was really enthusiastic about it before. <coughs> but anyway, I think without the strategic view of Copenhagen and this unbelievable idea to have Central Eastern Europe in the European Union, we would have seen things like in this region in the 90s or now in our Eastern partnership probably also much closer to your borders, on our borders, on the German borders. So, uh, my friends from France and from UK are totally right with saying enlargement is the most powerful transformation method ever has been. But of course, even the most powerful guys, when they are a bit old, they get a bit rumpy and rusty sometimes, and it's really great to have proposals how to clean them up. But there's one problem with cleaning up the house. Sometimes guests come at short notice 
And then, I mean, for example, when I didn't put the, the clothing for my children very well away, I know where to put it in the chamber or somewhere just close the door, nobody recognizes. <laughs> Europe does it as well. And also when my Ukrainian friends <laughs> came from one day to the next to live with me the next three and a half months, I wasn't able to clean up the house before. I'm really convinced that every deepening of the European Union except the first idea of the EQ was preconditioned by enlargement. If you look to the history of Europe, no deepening would have been there except the EQ without enlargement. EQ, by the way, had some uh, reasons because of Mexican crisis, uh, the euro later also because of some world finance businesses. And this is something uh, which uh, I really admire to hear a similar approach from uh, my colleague from France, um, we should have in mind. Um, the second point, which is perhaps important for you to say, um, you know, hope, yeah, I mean like, I asked my government to perhaps post me on this job. So if I think there was no hope or it would be senseless or make no fun, I probably stayed unemployed or tried to uh, have another job. No, it's, I mean, if you travel to the region like Stu said, a lot of hope is done because, I mean, this is one of the most wonderful regions with brilliant societies and great people. And you belong to the European Union. It's clear where the path should go. And also, I was doing a lot in Ukraine. I was traveling there a lot. I mean, um, we can be lucky that in this region we are much more close together. In the 90s, you know, a lot of countries which were in that moment just for a few days not anymore Soviet republics decided to as closely as possible align in whatever is possible, from children's rights to currency, with the Western model. And this strategic wisdom, I think, is something which some parts of this region will learn. But in war times, you want to be part of an alliance, not halfly not quarterly, you want and you need to be inside. So we want to take uh, the new government, the new chancellor, um, as a good precondition for reinvigorating Berlin process in that sense. We are really convinced that we can achieve something on and on the road to 3rd November, something which is good for the region, good for the regional cooperation, and good for enlargement itself. Something which is helping on every spot of these different angles, and also, by the way, giving perhaps a bit of new hope. New hope, which is to a certain extent, of course, uh, the old hope, um, but uh, for every beginning there is some uh, miracle in it, we say in German. Jedem Anfang wohnt ein Zauber inne. I'm not so good at translating it freely, but um, I think that there is. And what is clear is the German commitment is there. It's aiming on full membership, on eye level. We want to have every uh, citizen of the countries of the Western Balkan Six as citizens of the European Union with the same rights and the same duties. Uh, and this is our aim. And uh, our government is really convinced in doing what we can to be helpful for this. And the Berlin Process Summit should be one part uh, playing in this, uh, in this task. Thank you also for being uh, hopeful in many ways. We need that. Um, a sense of reality as someone coming from the region, working on this for over 25, six years, there is apathy. And people do not really think this is actually happening. So, while we understand the issues, I think less beautiful words, you're part of the European family, and more action in terms of concrete fixes on what is not really working, merit is extremely important, and as a country, as coming from a country that has really suffered with vetoes, that really torpedoes the merit, the supposedly merit-based idea of the process. 
if all of a sudden history is more important than fighting corruption, what have been, you know, what have been done in, from the process? So I think to encourage European, pro-European reformers in the region, please stick to your principles, even when it's not opportune, and help us to, to maintain this process, uh, a merit-based process. I know political realities and all that. And in that sense, the idea of qualified majority voting that Chancellor Schultz spoke about actually really helps enlargement as well. In, in Article 49 of Lisbon, we have anonymity, but at least in the interim stages, throughout the process, perhaps we can have QMV so that we have a meaningful uh, enlargement process. We now move to the two countries in the region represented uh, at this panel. Uh, first to uh, Nemanja Starovic, State Secretary of the Serbian uh, Foreign Ministry, who is with us. What is maybe your perspective against this background so far, what, what we have discussed? Uh, Serbia is sometimes mentioned as a country that can do more on alignment with CFCB, especially on uh, the restrictive measures and, and the sanctions. But I will not only push you on that, but also turn that around and say, if in Belgrade there was an uh, clear belief that this process is a serious one and it leads to membership, uh, would that make both alignment and the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue somewhat less challenging through the perspective of, the, of Serbia? Thank you, Nicola, my dear friend, for these questions. In the beginning, I must say that Although I do not have a trunk, it seems that I do represent a country that is elephant in the room. And I've heard there was a lot of talk about my country in previous two days. And thank you for the opportunity to finally have, have a say. And to try to, to directly answer your question, uh, and to put it this way, maybe to turn it a little bit around. If we have been already a full member of the European Union, you wouldn't have a need to pose such kind of question. We would be already a part of the common foreign and security policy. And on top of that, if we were six months or one year before the full membership, we would already fully align. Yet, as an eternal, everlasting candidate country, just like the rest of the countries in our region, our only duty, technically speaking, is to gradually align with the common foreign security policy, and that's exactly what we are doing. But I know that you were aiming for the issue of the sanctions against the Russian Federation, and I need to clarify a few things, and first of all, to thank Marco for acknowledging the fact that our approach from the day one of the Russian invasion, we have adopted our conclusions of the National Security Council just one day after the Russian invasion started, and our approach was based on common values and principles shared with the European Union. We have condemned and deplored Russian invasion on each and every occasion in UN General Assembly, OSC, Human Rights Council, etc. What, yet what we have not done, what we are not able to do at this particular moment is to join the sanctions regime. And why is that so? The answer is simple. Because introducing sanctions would be a devastating fact for our economy. Devastating. And that's a fact, of course. And still, as not being a member of the European Union, we are lacking political and economic safety that stems from the full membership. We're not having the same safety nets as we have seen during the COVID pandemics previously. I don't need to give you figures about the COVID relief packages that were provided for the full members of the European Union, but not to us as the candidate countries. But coming to the main topic of this panel, I just try to be very brief, you know. Uh, the Republic of Serbia is firmly committed to joining the European Union. It, was, it has been our firm commitment for the last 22 years. Of each and every government that we have had, with more or less success, we have, going, we have been advancing on that path. Of course, we have made certain mistakes. We have missed some opportunities. But now, at this moment, we are in a very advanced stage of membership negotiations, having opened 22 out of 35 
negotiating chapters, being the first country to fully endorse the new methodology, opening two clusters, pre fully preparing two additional ones. Yet if you ask me this simple question that you know everyone is asking us in Belgrade, when do we expect to become members of the European Union? I cannot give you an answer. Not just that, furthermore, if you ask me, are we going to become full members at all in a foreseeable future? And that, you know, the horizon of predictions cannot exceed 10 or 15 years. I cannot give you a definitely positive answer. And of course, that is a fact and that is something we must deal with. And you know, it, when, speaking, when we speak about old feelings, it was not always the case. I may, not, I may not be old by age, but I've been in, involved in politics for far too long, and I do remember the sensations and feelings we had after the Thessaloniki summit. More optimistic people saying, okay, we're gonna catch up with Romania and Bulgaria 2007, more pessimistic saying, eh, it might be 2009. Then there was so much talk, so much talk all across Europe, Europe about 2014 as a sentimentary of the beginning of the First World War and integrating the whole of the Western Balkans. Of course, nothing happened. I also remember 2018 and the uh, proposal of the Juncker Commission with some very, very tentative dates for Montenegro and Serbia setting in 2025 and how it was torpedoed by member states at Sofia summit just a couple of months after that. And now, unfortunately, nobody is even willing to speak about the end game, about the tentative dates. The last two messages that we got, first one from Prime Minister Mitsotakis of Greece, saying that he's hopeful that whole of the Western Balkans may integrate into the EU by 2033. So that's 11 years from now. And the second message, given exactly in Belgrade, a couple of months ago by German Chancellor Scholz, he said, believe it or not, that he's hopeful that the Western Balkans will integrate in the European Union during his lifetime. And then during what his, happened? During his mandate? Lifetime. And then what happened? How bizarre. Thousands of people in Serbia started Googling what is the age of Chancellor Scholl? <laughs> what is the average lifespan in Germany? Just to decipher the message. I'm not kidding you. That's what happened. You know? I don't know. I don't know. No, it was yes, in the Scholz is quite clear. He says it must be realistic in a foreseeable future that people feel it will be soon. Okay. Yeah, and I think he will be living so long, he personally thinks he will be Chancellor even so long. I appreciate that. <laughs> don't, don't make the jokes out of it. The credibility that, that Scholz wants Western Balkans <clears throat> having a concrete perspective that people know it will be soon, this is his personal commitment. And it doesn't bring that if we promise a date, I believe that. Don't make a joke of it. Scholz okay. really wants you to be fast on the track. I'm yeah? sorry, it was not my intention. I just to want to defend him because he's my boss. But, <laughs> but uh, just to emphasize, Thank you, Manuel, just to emphasize the overwhelming mood that we do have in Serbia and across the region, that is of course influencing the foreign policy decisions. You know, and you know we are involved in this process of enlargement, and it is designed to last forever if there is no sufficient political will to pull some candidate through it. And why is that so? Because of this involving these bilateral issues we have been talking about. You know, there are 27 member states. Each and every member state has like 75 opportunities to stall or completely block the accession of each candidate. So multiply 75 with 27, you see 2,000 potential political obstacles in front of every candidate country. We only have few minutes left, but I have to take at least, well, three minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have to, we have to invite, include you in this discussion. Among you, we have a keynote listener, Andrzej, who is uh, a recently appointed Slovenian special envoy on the Western Balkans. So I'm going to briefly ask you, have we missed a big topic? Uh, or, or you would like to maybe uh, ask the panel or one of the panelists something? 
and then at least one or two questions from the audience, and then we go back here, one minute, and then we are done. Is that okay? Talk quickly. Okay, Andre. Okay, thank you very so much. So you essentially have less than a minute, I think. That's impossible. <laughs> okay, and anyway. Yes, you were great, and again, thank you all for coming to Blit. <laughs> and this was de indeed an excellent debate. I was listening to both Western, panel, uh, Western Balkan panels and saw how all the issues related to or in and around Western Balkans are difficult but always interesting. Now, I will just mention a couple of points that I noticed in both panels. First of all, the growing skepticism about or around enlargement. Yes, there are sometimes good reasons for it, but it was also quite often pointed out that there is no alternative to enlargement in the region. And we heard quite clearly that the membership is indeed on the table. Now, due to all the difficulties like geopolitical circumstances, internal situations in the countries, lack of reforms, bilateral issues and so on, we are sometimes pessimistic. But I would like to end on a more optimistic uh, note. Let's say that uh, every pessimist is always positively surprised, and this is a good part of a <laughs> pessimism. And another note uh, that I would also like to mention is that there was indeed also progress in the region. Uh, one of the things that we mentioned or heard several times was that Albania and North Macedonia have opened negotiations uh, uh, with the EU. And this is crucial. This is even existential, I would say. Uh, so maybe the deal with Bulgaria was hard. It was definitely uh, asymmetric, but it is and it offers a way forward. And this is also a way how we should look at it. There is also a growing feeling, at least in the last couple of days, that there is some progress seen in the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. And this is also extremely important. In BIH, and this is probably my last point, uh, yes, we must do everything, they must do everything from their side to earn the candidate status. But also we, and we heard that several times at the Blitz Strategic Forum, must take this difficult political decision and grant them this status. So thank you again and... Uh, Good luck in your endeavors. I, <laughs> you took my words. I wanted to say this to all the panelists. Thank you. Do we have a question? Okay. In that case, uh, thank you so much. This... Please go ahead. Yes. I deserve yeah, it. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. I will not take a lot of your time, but I just want to say I don't know who from you was uh, at uh, the night owl session yesterday, but those who were there might remember that Slavoj Žižek spoke about situations where we all speak about, you know, the time is now and we all know what to do and it's five minutes to 12 and it's time to act and then we all go back home and do nothing. Let's make sure that we don't become part of the next story of Slavoj Žižek. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Samuel Zbogar, the State Secretary at the Slovenian Foreign Ministry, has an important, has an important closing announcement. Yeah, well, now you told me. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's my role to close the Blessed Strategic Forum uh, edition 2022. Um, I think you would agree this was the best ever, the most successful ever blessed strategic forum that we've had. Uh, we've seen growing it over the 17 years and I cannot in Im even imagine what's going to be uh, next. So I take this opportunity uh, really to thank Peter. Peter, Bravo, God, please. Peter. I can tell you it's, it's such a pleasure looking at a guy who enjoys his work so much. <laughs> uh, sorry? Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I, um, I think it's been great. It's been almost 2,000 participants. Uh, 
150, 160 panelists, uh, 25 panels. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been great. You've had a lot of discussions, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure you exchanged a lot of views. You, you maybe changed some of the views or, or you, um, you learned something. Uh, you got some ideas. Definitely had a lot of bilateral meetings, which is also one of the ideas of the Bled Strategic Forum. Um, so with this, I just want to, to close. I think the title was perfect for, for this year, the rule of law, the law uh, of the rule. Um, I think pretty much it's, it's becoming clear uh, what it should be, not necessarily we're there yet. Uh, but we're looking forward for next year, so announcement is next year, 28, 29, August. Um, we have 2023, 20, we have the next edition, and you're all welcome to this beautiful bled that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I'm closing the Bled Strategic Forum. <laughs>